Okay. Welcome to lecture four on Moby Dick, Ahab and the Prophetic Imagination. Yes, I know, another Moby Dick lecture to watch, but never fear. We're gonna shift these class sessions starting in a week or two to make them more interactive going forward. As the weeks go by without, you know, really being able to interact face to face uh, with one another very much. Um, I am reminded every day how much I love our little school and how much I actually like seeing you all, uh, despite the fact that I'm feeling very cozy and productive at home, reading books, planting spring vegetables, having push-up contests over FaceTime with old friends. Um, I hope you all are doing the same. And actually, um, you know, lectures may not be the worst way to traverse these initial land chapters, setting things up a bit before the plot, the main conflict really gets going. So that way you guys can feel informed and comfortable when it's time for you to take the captain's wheel a little bit more as we set out to sea. Um, believe me, I mean, I could keep doing this. I could keep talking about Moby Dick all term, uh, but uh, we'll get you guys a little more involved in the content creation here. And when exactly are we getting out to sea? Um, you know, we don't really set sail until page 110 of the novel and and you know Ahab doesn't show up till like page 124. Um, all of this stuff that we're talking about so far is really just prelude, right? It's still really just like revisions of an earlier draft that Melville had started writing before he met Hawthorne. You know, everybody knows that that Moby Dick is about Ahab chasing the whale, but where is he? We haven't seen him yet. Um, when in a few chapters, all of a sudden Melville pulls the curtain aside and Ahab walks out onto the quarter deck to reveal his man, the sailors realize that this is not the voyage they signed up for. And the reader too realizes this is not gonna be the book I thought it was going to be. So get ready for that. And in preparation uh, for the big reveal about who Ahab is and what he's really after, um, big pivot of the book, today we have to explain what the name Ahab would have signified to Melville's original post-Puritan audience, who would have been you know, reasonably familiar with some of these biblical names. Obviously, you know, the Bible is still a source of classic names and has been for generations. Uh, you know, we've got uh, you know, Isaac and Jacob and Jonah and John and Matthew and David and Samuel and Sarah, Ezekiel, Peter, Paul, Mary, Joseph, you know, a bunch of names that are still quite common today. But Melville really goes in for some deep cuts in these chapters, naming characters, you know, Bildad. Um, you know, if you look up Bildad on Wikipedia or something, um, he's one of the comforters from the book of Job, this like totally minor figure in this major book of the Old Testament. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about Job later. But, you know, how many of you were planning to name your first child Bildad, you know, or Ahab for that matter? Ahab doesn't really resonate with us the same way um, that other biblical names like, um, like, Adam is like, um, like Adam or something like that maybe do. So let's answer that question, you know, who was Ahab? How would that name have sounded in the ears of Melville's original audience? Well, Ahab was a historical figure, as far as anyone can tell. Um, he was the king of Israel, the northern kingdom, uh, approximately 850 BCE. And he's described in the Old Testament book of Kings as, quote, more evil than, other, than all the other kings before him. Uh, it is possible that this is hyperbole. There are some pretty wicked kings in the Old Testament, and you know, there's a lot of you know hyperbole uh, involved in that. Some of these literary genres, um, and uh, Ahab is um, actually his wife is maybe a little more famous uh, for being evil than he is. Um, he married a woman named Jezebel of Tyre, um, and so you know, uh, a Jezebel is still sort of like a you know pejorative term in in, in some circles. Um, Jezebel was a worshiper of a god named Baal. And you may recognize that name, Baal, from Paradise Lost. It's like B-A, you know, apostrophe A-L. Um, Paradise Lost, uh, Milton borrows the name Baal for one of his demons. Um, and, you know, the, the Book of Kings makes, makes reference to Jezebel um, wearing fine clothes and makeup and sort of, you know, she's presented as like, like a hussy for, uh, you know, 
caring about her appearance. Um, but her real sin uh, in some ways in, in the Old Testament is that she leads people away from the worship of the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and toward the worship of Baal, this false God. So Ahab um, uh, has married this woman and, and the people of Israel are in danger of losing their faith um, as a result. Um, Ahab is confronted. This is like the conflict with Ahab. He's confronted by a guy named Elijah who is described as, quote, a troubler of Israel. And Elijah is a prophet. And he is going to like predict that there's drought and famine and stuff like that. And, and what makes Elijah sort of, uh, you know, important as a prophet um, and an antagonist for, for Ahab is that Elijah is a defender of, of monotheism, of the one true God. And he says to Ahab, like, how long will you waver between two opinions? If God is God, follow him. If he's not, then, you know, just, but don't just sort of like pretend to be following God when you're not. Um, the people of Israel are like pretty ambivalent at this point um, about the worship of God. They're like uninspired. And so um, Elijah is like, you know, what will really get people's faith going is um, is we'll have like this this test. We'll have like this uh, battle of the gods, this kind of cosmic contest and uh, between like um, our God, the God of Israel and and Baal. Um, and his contest is like, we'll build these altars. This is really fun. Like the Old Testament is so, so good. There's like so much drama in it. Um, look forward to reading it if you haven't already. Um, Elijah builds these, these, these altars. And um, one of them is like going to be for the priests of Baal. And the other one is going to be for the God of Israel. And like uh, whichever, like, you know, uh, God can send fire from the sky and will and will um, consume um, the sacrifice on the altar with fire. That's the true God. Right. Makes sense to me. Um, uh, so the prophets of Baal try to get their their, you know, God to to listen to them and to let light the sacrifice on fire. Um, and it's not really working. Right. And Elijah's just like laughing at these guys and he's mocking them. And they, they're like, you know, um, cutting themselves and they're dancing. And Elijah's like, maybe your God's asleep. Maybe you should sing louder. Um, and the point in the old Testament, right. Is that their God is not real, or at least he has no power or something like that. Um, in the encounter, and then, of course, you know, Elijah prays one word to the true God and fire comes down and, you know, consumes the sacrifice. And everybody knows that that God is God. And Elijah has been vindicated against Ahab and Jezebel and the worshipers of Baal. And so Ahab is like, like potentially like a blasphemer. That's the first thing Melville's audience would have heard. He He's like um, against the truth. He's against the true God. And he gets confronted by the prophets that like bring him back. Um, there's one more encounter between Ahab and Elijah, uh, and it's about a vineyard. Um, there's a, there's a, actually there's a couple more encounters, but this is the cool one. Um, there's a vineyard uh, called the Vineyard of Naboth, um, which kind of sounds like a Star Wars planet or something, Naboth. Um, and uh, Ahab wants to buy this vineyard, um, maybe so he can plant some herbs in it for a Baal. It's, it's not really clear. Um, why he wants to do this. And he's like trying to get the vineyard by invoking some kind of like eminent domain law where the king can kind of take your land just because he wants it. And um, Naboth, who owns this vineyard, says, you can't buy the land. Um, you know, God has promised it to me. It's ancestral land. Um, and so Jezebel, the wicked queen, Ahab's wife, steps in and sort of arranges for Naboth's death. She kind of sets him up in this show trial um, and he is unjustly murdered. And Ahab is able to like take control of the vineyard. Um, Elijah confronts Ahab in the vineyard and he prophesies that dogs will lick the blood of Ahab from the ground. And that's pretty grim, right? So this is, um, uh, Ishmael references this when um, in, in Moby Dick when, when he hears the name Ahab for the first time. And he's like, isn't that the wicked king? Aren't dogs supposed to lick his blood from the ground? So Melville's like, like winking at you and reminding you just in case you don't fully remember like the story of Ahab. He's reminding you of the key points. Wicked king, blood on the ground. Um, the kind of cool thing about this uh, biblical story, um, for, especially from Melville's perspective, um, as like a modern writer, is that um, Elijah gives Ahab a choice. Ahab doesn't have to, he's not fated 
to like die and have his blood licked from the ground by dogs, right? There's there's like personal freedom in the biblical world that that of a kind that there just really isn't in in like classical Greek tragedy. You guys know about tragedy, right? There's the fates that you know your fate is plotted and and the gods are like in control and we think we're in control but we're not really. Um, no, in, in the the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament. Um, people have free will. They've got choice. They can choose to turn toward God or ch choose to turn away from God. And so Ahab is somebody who's confronted with a choice to turn toward God or to turn away from God. Um, he is also figured prominently um, in uh, another writer that you may know, um, Roger Williams, right, of, of Rhode Island. You've probably studied him in history class. Um, Roger Williams um, cites uh, uh, the biblical Ahab, um, not Melville's Ahab, the biblical figure, um, as a reason for the separation between church and state uh, in the early days of the American colonies. Roger Williams is sort of like church, state, separate them. Why? Because otherwise, like Ahab could take your vineyard. Um, Ahab, in other words, is not like totally unknown, even though he's kind of unknown to us, um, not unknown in Melville's day, uh, but he was not a positive figure, right? Uh, it's not like Melville is naming his captain, Captain Gabriel or Captain James or like something, you know, regal and uplifting like that. It's like Ahab, uh, bad vibes um, there. So uh, for this week, you're going to read about Ishmael's uh, encounter with a guy named Elijah, um, who is supposed to pre uh, sort of like uh, represent this biblical voice of prophecy in a way as he's about to get on the ship and Elijah warns him, like, you have a choice. You don't have to do this. Uh, uh, Elijah is, is the prophet. So we got to spend just, just a minute here uh, or 10 or 15 um, on the prophets, who the prophets were, because um, this is one of the genres that, that Melville is writing in. You know, there's many different genres in Moby Dick, but Melville writes huge portions of this book quite intentionally, quite self-consciously, it seems to most scholars, in the genre of prophetic discourse. Okay, I uploaded a handout on this. Um, and also, if you don't have, if you haven't uh, uh, downloaded the little um, um, handout that goes along with this lecture that you're supposed to kind of fill in as you go along, um, pause this and, and download that. So you've got uh, your handout on prophecy and the prophetic imagination um, on the one hand, and then you've got the, the, the worksheet you're supposed to fill in uh, as you're listening here. Um, so make sure you've got those. Um, but uh, I take a look at the handout. I've, I've uploaded this handout. Uh, it does need a little bit of unpacking and um, really we're gonna try to pay attention to what's going on here with um, the prophetic genre because it's quite a bold move for an author to make even for Melville. Um, okay, so your handout tells you that in the Bible, the prophets are not necessarily concerned with seeing the future. Um, we would think of prophecy as somebody who could like predict an earthquake or predict a plague uh, or something like that. Um, the prophets are not so much concerned with the future, but with seeing the present more clearly. The prophets are the ones who see what's really going on right, right before us all, but, but nobody can really like sort of call it what it is. Um, the prophets use the correct names for um, for injustice. Um, the prophets are the ones who really take a long, sober look at their society, and they have the courage to proclaim what is almost always a very unpopular message, which is that God is angry, right? God is angry about the injustices and idolatries that the rest of us have accommodated ourselves to, and we just don't notice. But the prophets um, see them, and God sees them, and they are going to call us to change. So um, in the Bible, um, there are like the word Biblia, right? Uh, means library, Biblia library. There's like a lot of different genres in the Bible. Like between those covers, there's a, a whole library of different genres. And um, some of those genres are concerned more with like personal piety, you know, the correct religious attitudes and, and priestly observances and all of that. Um, other genres are concerned more with social justice and ethical action toward other people. The prophets call on people uh, to do social justice, right? This is their main message, uh, to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with your God. Um, they're not trying to just talk about social justice all day, like online on their Twitter accounts, so people will know how woke we are. Um, no, it's not like virtue signaling. Like they're really, they're all about action. Um, it might be surprising to us at first because you would expect expect the prophets or like any you know biblical writer to be very pious, um, but but not always uh, or not exactly right. The prophets are like really openly against 
outward shows of religious piety that are not accompanied by active concern for the poor, for the widow, for the orphan, for the, the immigrant, the stranger in one's community, right? The, um, the alien in your midst. Um, is, that's the Old Testament, uh, the, the King James translation. Uh, it sounds like there's UFOs, but no, just the one who is not from this land. Um, take care of that person um, if you are uh, at home here. So um, this call still has a lot of resonances today. Um, I gave you on your worksheet this long um, passage from, from um, the prophet Amos. He's like one of the minor prophets. And he says this, I, I think I highlighted it on your worksheet. Um, here's, here's the quote. I mean, it is, this is powerful stuff. Um, he says, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. Okay, that's the quote. And if you're reading along in the text I gave you in the handout, you may notice that there are some quotation marks here, right? Who exactly is speaking? It is the Lord, the Lord your God speaking here. And God does not mince words, right? He says, I hate this. Um, I will not accept this. Your songs are noise to me, not music. Um, these texts are full of anger, righteous anger at those who worship daily in the temple, um, and, and show everybody how, how pious they are, all the while grinding the faces of the poor in the street. Um, Ishmael actually uses that phrase at one point uh, in Moby Dick. Um, it's straight out of the, the, the prophets, grinding the faces of the poor. This is what they are against. Um, social justice is, is where they stand. Um, if we fail, if we fail, to welcome the stranger in our midst and, and to welcome those in need, to, uh, to aid them. Um, God has no regard for our offerings, no matter how loud we sing. And the prophets say then, be careful, right? Um, you who wish to see the day of the Lord, be careful. Maybe it's going to be darkness, not light. It will be like you fled from a lion, Amos says, only to meet a bear. I mean, this is just like unbelievable imagery, right? I, I've got to, you know, there's, I put a page or two of it in there for you to read um, to get a, a flavor for. It's just really, really powerful poetry. There's, there's no question about it. Um, the prophets are, are trying to get our attention using whatever rhetorical um, and literary devices uh, uh, they have available. Um, you may also recognize uh, some of these images, you know, like justice rolling down for, like water. Um, this is from uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. Um, you may recognize some of the stuff from the speeches of Abraham Lincoln, right? Woe unto them through whom injustice comes and the offense comes and all of this stuff. Um, what I'm trying to show you here, right, is that the rhetoric of Old Testament prophecy has a very prominent place in American letters in American like um, political life and, and literary life and social life, um, in part uh, because there continue to be you know there continues to be plenty of injustice out there for people to be angry about. And how do you mobilize people? Um, you do it with with the rhetoric of of the prophets of prophetic language. Um, uh, that's been like a, a, a solidly American uh, uh, genre for for a while. Um, you know, what's the old saying, right? If you're not mad, you're not paying attention. And so the prophets are going to try to try to convey some anger and get you to pay attention. Now, um, Amos is sort of a minor prophet. Um, one of the major prophets um, is a guy named Jeremiah. Okay, Jeremiah is a prophet in the Old Testament who's traditionally known as the weeping prophet. Why? Because he laments, he weeps for the sins of Israel, calling on them to repent of evil and return to justice for all. And in the 1970s, um, a literary critic uh, at Harvard named Sakvan Berkovich, is also kind of an interesting name, um, Sakvan Berkovich, he wrote an influential book called The American Jeremiad. Okay, The American Jeremiad. And uh, the book actually, um, I don't have it on my shelf here, I have it 
at school. Um, but uh, it actually opens, um, if I'm remembering rightly, with uh, not just one, but two epigraphs from Herman Melville. Um, I don't think either of them are from Moby Dick. But uh, anyway, he, he opens with like Melville, his book on the American Jeremiah. And this book traces the influence of um, the prophetic voice in early American writing. And um, he makes this argument. He says, look, the Jeremiad, the, he calls it the Jeremiad. That's a great word, right? Uh, this is a genre. It's a genre of writing or speaking that joins lament and celebration. Okay, you got it? Lament, like tears on the one hand and celebration or like praise on the other. Tears and praise, lament and celebration. Um, for what purpose? Well, it, we're joining lament and celebration in the service of social and spiritual reform. Okay, reform is always the goal, social justice. Um, the Jeremiah warns of downfall, but offers hope. It's never cynical or like totally despairing because change is always possible. Change begins not with a new social movement, um, which may or may not come, but with like a personal change of heart. And that is always something that we have a choice about. Even in the darkest hours, we can change our hearts. So there's a hopeful message here. Um, the prophetic call um, is to hope that we should turn around, okay? And Melville, um, understanding that, that sort of structure of the Jeremiah is going to help us grasp Melville's rhetoric in Moby Dick, especially Father Mapple's sermon in that chapter. And it may be this later chapter that you're going to read here titled The Prophet. Um, I think it's like, you know, about page 100 or something like that. You're going to read that next time um, where Ishmael confronts Elijah or rather maybe the other way around. Um, but, okay, what is the structure of the Jeremiah of prophetic discourse? Okay, there are three parts, according to Zach Van Berkovich. He says, um, there's number one, an account of past blessings. All right, so it starts in the past. Things were good at one point. Uh, number two, a condemnation of present sins. Things are not good anymore, and it's because you guys have made poor choices, basically. And number three, um, hope. There is hope in the prophetic genre, hope for the future. Where? In repentance, in turning around and changing your heart. Okay. So that three-part structure, um, time to get like, time, time for me to try to make English class like super relevant for a moment. Um, so get ready. Uh, feel free to borrow this three-part structure if you ever want to get elected to anything, right? Um, it's just like the, the best way for like um, political rhetoric to, to, to work in the easiest way. Um, if you're trying to get elected to student council, for in instance, you could use the three-part structure here. You could say, number one, our house used to be great and mighty, and then move on to number two, but presently we have fallen from glory and we've lost the golden hedgehog by being complacent about spirit week and, and excoriate people for their sins in the present and then turn toward hope, right? And say, number three, but vote for me. And I promise to make Sloka great again, make our house great again, right? Um, you can see that this kind of rhetoric is very, very effective. Um, it works super well. Um, actually, it's, it was interesting to me in 2016, a lot of people in California, uh, maybe not in other parts of the country, but, but certainly out here on the coast, right, were like a little bit surprised when Donald Trump was elected. Um, you know, a lot of people believed, you know, maybe Hillary Clinton is like more qualified and prepared. Um, but it's like, no, like, don't you understand the power of the Jeremiah and like, President Trump just like nails it. Um, he's got this whole message, right? America used to be great in the past. I, like, I'm not sure when exactly he's talking about, like maybe back in Andrew Jackson's time. I think Jackson has, is like his favorite president, he says. Um, but so somewhere in the past, right? It's better if you don't specify. Um, but then in the present, we screwed up, you know, by like signing these bad trade deals and, you know, giving people health insurance and stuff like that. And uh, number three, you move toward the future. You, you point people toward um, a, like a great future. Um, now we can make America great again, right? I mean, he just like, like 
has the formula down and it works really well. Um, this is how you get elected or you start a movement. You, you master the Jeremiah form. Um, you can imagine somebody on the other side of the political aisle, like a climate activist or something, also using that past, present, future structure, saying, you know, long ago, human beings lived in harmony with nature, but now we're alienated from nature and we despoil it. And so turn to like a new green, new deal to restore the earth for future generations. And, and, and they move toward the future. Like it, it makes you think that like every politician should have an English professor on his or her campaign as a strategist, right? Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Obama campaign did an amazing job of this in like 2008 when they made those posters that said change, right? Repent. Uh, th that's what the prophets are calling for is a change for reform. Um, imagine if you made a campaign poster that was like more of the same, right? That doesn't really inspire people or like things are already pretty okay and should just keep on being okay, right? Uh, that was sort of like the the um, Clinton campaign in, in 2016 and, and people didn't seem very inspired. Um, so uh, yeah, this is a, there's a long tradition of this in, in American um, um, social life. Uh, and um, I've got here on your handout that it, it goes back to these like 19th century reform movements that were surrounding Melville. This was like all the energy in Massachusetts around the time Melville is writing um, in 1850. Um, they were all using this Jeremiah form uh, for progressive social causes um, like abolition, you know, um, getting rid of slavery or uh, women's liberation. So all these figures um, were using this, this stuff and we forget like how radical those positions were. These were like really radical political positions, like abolish slavery totally, not just kind of keep the status quo, slavery in the South, no slavery in the North. Um, that's what most people wanted, you know, even maybe perhaps Lincoln um, up, up to a point. And, um, uh, you know, the idea that women could vote, these were very radical things. So you need like a radical message, uh, like the, like the prophetic rhetoric, um, in the 20th and 21st century, in our own times, we see, um, these movements that have led to, to, you know, um, women being, women being able to vote, right. Um, suffrage, um, human rights, um, uh, with the declaration that the UN put out in the forties. Um, civil rights um, in, in the U.S. in the 60s, um, LGBTQ rights, climate activism, like basically any social reform movement um, today um, is, is drawing on this rhetoric of prophecy. And, and whether or not we would like personally align ourselves with any of these causes, it is important to see that they have their roots in the Old Testament. They have their roots in the same place that Melville had its roots in the 19th century um, um, American Jeremiah and then in, in the the prophets and the, the Old Testament call to, to social justice. Um, another thing to point out about the prophets, um, this is, is not to be overlooked. Um, the prophets are outsiders. They're always outsiders. I think Alex actually in the comments had a really nice phrase in one of his posts. He said that Ishmael is like an outcast by choice or something along those lines, right? He chooses to, to be on the margins because maybe the prophetic critique works better from the margins than it does from the center. When you try to like sort of centralize that, uh, um, that idea of, of like, you know, radical change, then things become unstable and people are not happy. But, uh, you know, when that voice comes from the margins, it, it, that's, that's sort of the right vector in some ways. Um, the prophets, I'm trying to say, are generally not part of like the inner circle of power in society, you know, the, like the priestly establishment um, um, in the old days. The prophets warn us uh, that we have drawn the inner circle of blessing, of power, perhaps too narrowly, right? And they do it from outside that circle. They warn us that we have like excluded some people from that circle in order to like enrich a smaller number of people, um, you know, ourselves who are inside that circle. And what we need to do is heed this call from the outsiders in, in order to expand the circle, in order to keep those who are in power from becoming decadent and soulless. Um, you know, it's not like there's never going to be, there's always going to be like an inner circle and an outer circle. There's, there's always going to be power disparities in the world. The prophets are not saying like, you know, everybody should just be like totally, you know, the same. Um, they're saying they're trying to be the conscience of those who are in power. And it's really hard to be the conscience of those who are in power if you are also in power in the inner circle. So they have to do this from the outside um, and, 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 and help us realize that power should be wielded for good, right? Often it's not. It's not that power is like always bad. 
Um, it can be used for good. We just don't do it. So prophetic ethics is largely about outsiders speaking truth to power. Got it? Outsiders speaking truth to power. Um, you may even know this uh, Simon and Garfunkel song that says, the words of the prophets are written on the subway walls and tenement halls, right? The sound of silence. Uh, the words of the prophets are written on the subway walls, okay? Well, the prophets are not you know, speaking their words in the halls of power, typically. They're the ones who are tagging graffiti on the walls outside, like of the subway, and getting arrested for protesting the war, or, or uh, you know, saying what we're all generally like too comfortable and complacent to notice. So calling out the evils and injustices that, that um, the powerful have accommodated ourselves to. Um, prophetic energy uh, is inherently oppositional somehow. Um, it's opposed to establishment values of comfort, greed, um, cheap grace. Um, for the prophets, it's not about who has earned what or who is worthy of your help, but it's about who needs your help, right? The, the prophets have an ethics of need, not an ethics of deservingness. You know, who needs something? That's the question the prophets will ask. Um, so be careful, right? The prophets are not against the establishment just to be against it, right? They're against the establishment in order to purify it, in order to turn it toward its correct purposes so that, that um, society can be more just and equitable and joyful and, and open to the needs of the most vulnerable among us. Um, here's one, um, I put this on your sheet just so you can see that this continues today. Um, this is like one um, prophetic voice in American Letters who uses the Jeremiah form a lot, um, this author Wendell Berry from Kentucky. And he says, uh, this is a great quote. Um, and it's really, you know, this is hard stuff, isn't it? It's, it, it's hard stuff to read. It's challenge. It challenges us. Um, he's not going to, the prophets are not trying to make you comfortable. They're trying to unsettle us. So Wendell Berry says, um, this is on your handout. Uh, he says, uh, quote, you can best save civilization by being against what usually passes for it. Marriage without love, sex without joy, drink without conviviality, birth celebration and death without adequate ceremony, faith without doubt or trial, belief without deeds, manners without generosity, good English without exact speech, without honesty, without literacy. That's, the, that's Wendell Berry. That's the prophetic um, voice, you know, trying to speak to us today. Um, although if we were to update it a little bit, you know, you guys have heard maybe these debates about like, you know, how many lives is it potentially worth during this pandemic to restart the economy? Um, and just like weighing that utilitarian, utilitarian calculus, you can imagine what a prophet might say. A prophet might come and say, you know, human life has infinite value. What kind of number could you put on a human life and sort of call us out on some of our, um, you know, compromises that we want to make um, uh, in, in the name of, of civilization. You know, the prophets are those who can help us save civilization, save our humanity by, by calling BS on what usually passes for humanity, what usually passes, passes for civilization, um, and saying, you know, we can do better. We need to do better for ourselves, for each other. Um, so one other uh, weapon that the prophets use, this is uh, your next section on the handout, um, and Melville actually wields this to great effect. Um, it's the weapon of, of laughter, okay? Um, not just any kind of laughter, ha ha ha, but, but subversive, ironic laughter, um, laughter um, that, that kind of calls out uh, um, the incongruities of, of life and, and says, hey, what's go what really going on here? Sometimes laughter um, helps us do that. So I've got this quote from this other like prophetic modern figure um, who is a contemporary of Melville. He's writing at the exact same time. Um, his name is uh, Soren Kierkegaard, um, a Danish philosopher. And Kierkegaard in this quotation calls the world a Trophonian cave. And you're like, okay, what is that reference? Well, a Trophonian cave, it's like one of, it was like one of Zeus's oracles, um, favorite hangouts. And th this, this cave was supposed to be like so awe inspiring that anybody who looked at it forgot how to smile. It's like, this cave really sucks. Like, it's so cool that you're like, ah, like you, you just makes you serious. Um, 
Okay, so Kierkegaard in this passage is, is going to compare society to like a Trophonian cave where they try to, you know, um, impress you with with everything and then you you don't laugh and you don't smile anymore. And then um, he, he says like the return of laughter is this prophetic thing that is going to say the emperor has no clothes. Um, so he says here, this is the, the quote from the handout. He says, when I was very young, I forgot in the Trophonian cave how to laugh. When I became an adult, when I opened my eyes and saw actually, then I started to laugh and have never stopped laughing since that time. I saw, according to the adult world, right? I saw the meaning of life was to make a living. It's goal to become a counselor. That the rich delight of love was to acquire a well-to-do girl that the blessedness of friendship was to help each other in financial difficulties, that wisdom was whatever the majority assumed it to be, that enthusiasm was to give a speech, that courage was to risk being fined 10 bucks, that cordiality was to say, may it do you good after a meal, that piety was to go to communion once a year. This I saw and I laughed. That's the quote. Again here, Kierkegaard is not against piety or friendship or wisdom or courage and all those things that he mentions. Far from it, he's against what passes falsely for them. And laughter can be a prophetic genre that unmasks these half-truths and half-hearted ways of living that so often pass for like respectable life. Um, laughter draws our attention to um, the incongruities that we're living. And paradoxically, you know, the way to respect the seriousness of life is not to enter the Trophonian cave and never like smile again. It's to laugh at all the counterfeit substitutes that distract us from the real thing. That's the prophetic imagination. Melville is really good at this. You may start to notice. Um, okay, so if you get this model of prophetic discourse, prophetic critique, you will be better prepared to register um, how Melville's humor is working in the next few chapters. Uh, while he's poking fun at characters like Peleg and, and Bildad, who, uh, you know, Bildad is more concerned with profits uh, than with the just distribution of wealth. Um, so, all right, let's look at the book here. Um, on page 79, um, I think this is sort of your reading for, for this week. Um, page 79, he says um, of Bildad, um, very probably he, Bildad, had long since come to the sage and sensible conclusion. And you know, when he says sage and sensible, he means maybe it's not. Um, that a man's religion is one thing and this practical world quite another. This world pays dividends. Like this is pretty much the opposite of the prophet's message, right? Which is that what you do with your dividends, your earnings, is not separate from Sunday worship. Um, that this world and the other world need to be integrated, right? How you help those in need or fail to help those in need reveals um, the God we truly serve. No matter how like fancy our pious language and, and platitudes and, and the praise songs we may sing on Sunday. Um, Bildad is sort of like this ordinary garden variety American capitalist who has his profit margin figured out like down to the last decimal point, while others around him, the sailors, do the hard and dangerous work of hunting the whales. And Bildad sees no contradiction in attending Sunday worship before heading off to butcher the most majestic animals in God's creation for cash. Um, and while Melville somewhat gleefully caricatures him as like kind of this harmless old hypocrite, um, Melville knows that the world is, is more or less run by Bildads. Um, and this is another reason that Ishmael has no interest in like the truths of the land that he wants to take to sea. Um, we should note that uh, we find the exact opposite of Bildad with his like, you know, concern for the bottom line for getting paid um, in the figure of Father Mapple. Right. So you read Father Mapple um, last week, um, his sermon, and his, this like strange and, and, and profound sermon um, strikes a distinctly prophetic tone. It's one of the more prophetic um, moments in these early chapters of, of Moby Dick. Um, Father Mapple argues contra Bildad that we must pursue the truth 
at all costs, no matter the cost. So this is page 50, um, Father Mapple's sermon. He says, delight is to him who gives no quarter in the truth and kills, burns, and destroys all sin, though he pluck it out from under the robes of senators and judges. Delight, top gallant delight, is to him who acknowledges no law or Lord, but the Lord his God, and is only a patriot to heaven. Melville, of course, you remember, is a very patriotic person, and he's extremely proud of his Revolutionary War ancestry and all that, but the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act, I think I mentioned this before, um, the, the Fugitive Slave Act in 1850 forces him to take sides between what is comfortable and what is right, between the law of the land and the call of the prophets to repent and protect the powerless, the runaway slaves. And uh, Father Mapple, he channels that, that voice in, into the book in, in the form of Father Mapple. And you have to decide whether, Mapple says, whether you stand with the truth whether you stand with the prophets or whether you stand with the powerful, whether you're a patriot to heaven or to your own standing and advancement in this world. Bildad is like, no, you don't have to choose. And Mapple says, yeah, you do. He says, um, you know, uh, at one point, if only if we obey God, we must disobey ourselves. And it is in this disobeying ourselves wherein the hardness of obeying God exists, right? Everybody wants to stand for the truth until it costs us something personally. And the prophets and, and, and Mapple tells us, no, um, to preach the truth in the face of falsehood. This is it, right? It is what you must do. Um, telling the truth will not always make you many friends. Uh, everybody knows this. But if you want to fight for what's right, you've got to be prepared to take your lumps. It's going to require some real courage. Um, but if you don't stand up for what's right, somebody else is going to pay for it somewhere down the road, probably someone with less power than you have. Um, so even if it costs you, um, Mapple says, uh, that that's your one obligation in this world is, is to stand for the truth. Um, everything in this world has its price. Um, Father Mapple tells us. Um, you may as well stake your life on something that is actually worth what it's going to cost. Uh, but it's going to cost. Um, Father Mapple, he's an interesting figure, right? He's he's kind of this quirky outsider, um, but he's also, Ishmael points out, like one of the dudes. Uh, he has the respect of all the hardcore whaling guys in New Bedford, and he dresses like them, uh, you know, and he is he's risked his life with them out there on the seas, and so he has their respect um, when he speaks. Um, Ishmael walks into this chapel covered in memorial markers. There's like gravestones uh, everywhere or reminding us like what a dangerous enterprise whaling is. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of widows in these whaling towns from, from men who've died at sea. And Ishmael reminds us um, in this chapter that like a whale maybe can stave his body, can smash him and do him in, but stave his soul, Jove himself cannot. Right? This is part of the, the prophetic message um, that, that there's something more important than your safety. Um, uh, uh, that's the truth, right? Socrates says, uh, the good person has nothing to fear from physical harm. Um, he or she should be more afraid of, of, of telling a lie, um, which will stain your soul, um, or of worse, living a lie, right? Um, once you live for the truth, uh, then you're less concerned for your own safety with what other people will think of you. And you just become concerned with what's right. Um, there's a great line uh, from the, the 20th century novelist, Flann Flannery O'Connor. Uh, if you've taken Miss Shotwell's creative writing class, I'm sure you've read F Flannery O'Connor. She says, um, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you odd. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you odd. Father Mapple is certainly like an odd figure, right? He's this salty old sea dog with the soul of a prophet climbing up these like cabled ro ropes to a pulpit that's shaped like a ship's brow. It's all like a very kind of absurd scene, isn't it? Uh, but then once you start preaching, you realize that he maybe he's the real deal. Um, uh, he's, he says, preach the truth to the face of falsehood. And, um, and he seems to live this as well. Um, the chapter closes with him pouring his heart out to these sailors with no concern for like fancy theological 
phrases or prayers. He's speaking as one of them uh, with no concern for anything but the plain and simple truth um, and fidelity to the truth as far as he can see it. This is his only duty to the truth. Um, and in the end, he is left kneeling on uh, the floor of the chapel alone with his face in his hands. Um, and it's just a, a weird and stunning scene. Um, there's not much else like it in, in all of literature, I would say. Um, but then, of course, immediately after this super intense chapel scene with the sermon, then we get Queequeg's heavily ironized, I don't even know what to say about it, like pagan religious ceremony uh, as a kind of counterbalance to like the, the sermon that we've just heard. And it's not really clear whether Melville is like leveling down what he's just said in the Father Mapple sermon, or if he's leveling up Queequeg and Yojo as like a multiculturalist, or is he doing both? And, uh, or is he making fun of, I don't know. Uh, you see this throughout Moby Dick, right? This sense that, that the truth is like this really big tent and there are many different people that can dwell beneath it. And maybe in fact, it's better that way if all these people are dwelling beneath it. Um, on page 55, he has this really interesting um, uh, riff here where he says, um, he's talking about being cold under the blankets and it's like, you know, a part of you uh, is, you will be warmer if a part of you is, if like the tip of your nose is cold, then the rest of you will be warmer under the blankets. Um, and he says, you know, to truly enjoy bodily warmth, some part of you must be cold for there is no quality in this world that is not what it is merely by contrast. Nothing exists in itself. If you flatter yourself that you are all over comfortable and, and have been so a long time, then you cannot be said to be comfortable anymore. Okay. So like, you know, if you've been comfortable for like an hour, then you're not really comfortable. But if you come in out of like the cold and the rain and you sit by the fire, then you're comfortable. All right. So things are what they are not in themselves, but, but by way of contrast, um, he says, um, proceeding by contrast, by contraries, knowing things by their opposites, flipping back and forth between, you know, the sermon and the, the worship of the little idol Yojo. Um, this is one of Melville's constant strategies. Um, so look for that. Um, remember like the, the chapter on Nantucket, I think it's chapter 14. Um, Nantucket is right, this, this little island off the coast of, of uh, Massachusetts. Uh, I think Mr. Rogers used to have a, a house out there. And, um, and uh, it's like this little sand hill and Melville describes it with this flurry of images only to end the, the paragraph by saying, you know, and all this only goes to show that Nantucket is no Illinois. And it's like, duh, yeah, it's an island made of sand. It's not nothing like Illinois. Um, but but really what he's doing is he's putting in practice this idea that you can know something only by contraries. You know something only by knowing its opposite. So he has to like, this is why Moby Dick is so capacious and so big. In order to know one thing, you have to know like everything else around it, um, which it is not. To know what something is, you have to know what it's not. So Melville's gonna explore like everything and the book just gets bigger and bigger and bigger as a result. Um, on the subject, though, of Nantucket and of these islands, we also get um, another island, uh, another contrasting, a contrasting island, you might say. Um, we get this chapter on Queequeg's biography about growing up on the island of Cocovoco, which is Ishmael says is not actually on any map uh, because, quote, true places never are. That's from page 57. Um, and I think this is one of the questions on your handout, right? I'd, I'd be curious to know um, what you guys think he means by that. True places are never on any map. Um, one possible take uh, is, though I don't know if this is correct, um, you know, perhaps that our maps of reality, you know, our words, our scientific concepts, the things that we use to kind of map out the world um, conceptually, um, our maps just as often conceal what's in front of us as much as they reveal it, okay? Melville is talking about a place here. So imagine that like you and I live in the same place, the same town. And as far as the map is concerned, uh, we might be living in, you know, San Luis Obispo or Atascadero, but um, the map doesn't tell the truth because two people could be living in the same town or even in the same under the same roof and be living in totally different realities that are even more real than like this map 
abstraction called Atascadero or San Luis Obispo or something like that. Um, the reality that you're living might be totally different than re the reality that your neighbor is living. Those are the true places that you live. The map just shows like a name and you know some spatial coordinates. Um, maybe the closest you can get of a true map. He says true maps are never never um, um, uh, written down on paper, but maybe you can get a true map of a place in poetry or in art or in some other kind of imaginative, creative language that is faithful to the interior life where we actually live, right? That's what it's actually like to be alive, to be here, to be somewhere, um, to be you, to be to be now, right? Um, that's what, what art captures. And that's the truth about a place that a map could never tell you. Um, so like there's this famous uh, illustration of uh, Queequeg's Island by an artist uh, named Rockwell Kent. Um, and actually I, I know a guy, um, who, he's a TV producer and he's got a Rockwell Kent um, illustration, the, the, the one of Coco Voco of Queequeg's imaginary island um, uh, tattooed on his forearm. He's got Queequeg, Queequeg's Island tattooed on him uh, to remind him um, of this, that, that true places are not um, the places you can see. They're not the places on the map. Um, they're like the, the, the way that you live there, which you could never sort of um, um, represent. Um, please don't do that. Please don't. I know some of you are very bored at home, but don't go tattoo yourselves with, you know, passages of Moby Dick. I know, I know this is tempting to do. I'm not advocating that. Uh, you know, just think about this, this point and, and try to absorb uh, Melville's point here. Uh, that true places are never down on any maps, um, but we live inside of them, nevertheless. Um, the Coco Voco thing also helps explain like this one other um, funny cross-cultural confrontation between uh, Ishmael's loosely Presbyterian Christianity and Queequeg's um, pagan from Ishmael's perspective, uh, religious beliefs. Um, and, and so did you guys notice this? This is just insane. The totally absurd and like unconvincing argument Ishmael gives at the bottom of page 54. Um, this art argument is not, uh, it, I mean, it's like, sophistical, right? Meaning it's like the ancient Greek sophic, sophists who were the enemies of Socrates who could make anything false seem true through like a fancy series of arguments. And Ishmael uses these logical terms like ergo to conclude that God actually wants him to become an idolater and worship Yojo alongside Queequeg instead of worshiping the infallible Presbyterian church, uh, which of course has never claimed to be infallible, but Ishmael is being extremely silly and he's balancing like Father Mapple's earnestness um, with its contrary, with silliness, um, to let you know that he can laugh at himself um, he can laugh at the kind of like like liberal religion that wants to say all doctrines are equally true. And he can also laugh at like the conservative Calvinist religion, which would say that only their doctrine is true out of all the doctrines in the whole world. And we are the ones who got it right, thankfully. And Ishmael is just, just laughing at both of these things. And he's laughing at himself and he's laughing at his predicament, which is really our predicament, which is that we must seek the truth. And we always have to start from where we start from, right? We always have to start somewhere from our particular particular culture, from our particular way of looking at things. Even knowing that there are so many other cultures and ways of looking at things, um, no one is ever going to get it entirely right. And yet we must keep trying. And that's part of the, the absurdity of the human condition is, is trying to get both of those things together, that you have to seek the truth and you're not going to find it. Um, totally nobody, all of us. Um, so you just gotta laugh about who we are and throw our hands up and place yourself in like the trust of some higher truth. Um, and, and the way to do that is to, to laugh <laughs> in a way, um, instead of to, you know, become very rigid and, and dogmatic about it. Um, so uh, yes, uh, Ishmael, I think is saying, Melville is saying <clears throat> that we go wrong in all of these really interesting ways and like the ways that human beings go wrong are what make up culture and that's what makes culture interesting um it's not the, this just the things that we get right but the, the things that we don't get right um and so uh you know you can try to accept everything is true 
but that means that that nothing is really true if everything is true, right? So that doesn't work. Or you proclaim you can proclaim that that nothing is true and like be a nihilist, um, in which case you're like can be committing a logical fallacy, right? If you say nothing is true, then you have to ask, well, is that true? I thought nothing was true, but you're saying that nothing is true, and is that true? So Ishmael is basically underlining the fact that we are pretty pathetic with regard to the truth, um, yet our lives are nothing if we don't try. And so we're all doing the best we can with what we have um, as like 19th century Presbyterians or 21st century San Luis Obispans or maybe like Tahitian Islanders or, you know, whoever or wherever we are. Um, the chapter ends, I think this is so beautiful. The chapter ends with Ishmael and Queequeg in bed together, like smoking the tomahawk pipe, keeping each other warm as, as bosom friends, he says. Um, so that's sweet, right? After all of the, the discourse of like truth and falsity of religion, you know, hey, let's just sit down together and like, you know, pass the, 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 the pipe of peace around. Um, and Ishmael says, uh, at one point, he says, it's a wicked world in all meridians. It's a wicked world in all meridians. So, you know, we may as well be kind to each other and we may as well keep each other warm uh, while we're trying to navigate it, this wicked world and, and find something like the truth. Just be kind while you're doing this. Okay, um, that's a lot. Uh, so for this week, um, we're almost out to sea, not quite there yet. Uh, this is the last week on land. Um, and as you read along this week, you'll be introduced to the ship, to the Pequod, um, to its owners, uh, Bildad, Peleg. Um, and they're funny because they, they also can't really quite pronounce Queequeg's name. They call him Quahog, um, which is a type of clam, I think. And also like the town that they live in in that show Family Guy. Um, which is set, you know, just outside of Massachusetts there, Rhode Island. And um, they call Queequeg a hedgehog at one point and other things. And so we, we'll get that. We'll get a famous description of Ahab. Um, this is what we'll focus on with the lecture next time. We'll focus on um, um, this description, I think, um, even though we won't meet Ahab quite yet. <clears throat> and he's described um, in this next section as, quote, a grand, ungodly, godlike man. A grand, ungodly, godlike man. Okay, that's weird. What could that mean? It's a really precise description, but also maybe not a very auspicious one. We'll talk about it a lot next time and we'll unpack it. Um, I hope these lectures are helping you comprehend what you're reading. But again, they're just my take on the book along with a bunch of other scholars that I've read. Um, these takes are not etched in stone, so feel free to raise questions about them and have a different outlook on Moby Dick. Um, I would love to encounter a new way of seeing this fascinating and prismatic book. Um, so get ready. We're about to take a big turn uh, two classes from now. Um, we'll get to Ahab, we'll get to his pipe, and uh, we'll see what happens there. All right, um, I will end this and I hope you guys have a lovely Thursday.